Hello. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, my name's Steve Marks. I'm a member of the CMC Board of Directors and uh, also president of Hannah News Service here in Columbus. Today's forum, Opioid Update, Tragedy, Money, Healing, Big lawsuits, the flow of money from settlements, the tragedy of opioid addiction on families, especially children, on communities, first responders, and medical personnel, on survivors, what are the, what are the efforts and effects of law enforcement, treatment centers, employers, perhaps a new research and other approaches can make a difference. Um, many of these challenges end up or are directly impacted by one key office in Ohio, that of the Attorney General. It's a heavy responsibility. Please welcome Ohio's Attorney General, Dave Yost. And our host for today's conversation, Chief of the State House News Bureau, Ohio Public Radio and TV, Karen Kassler. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with the Attorney General. And, and normally I would try to crack some jokes here because he's one of the funniest state uh, office holders. He's very quotable. He has lots of things that he can uh, weigh in on that are, are really amusing. He plays how many instruments? Multiple. <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> Multi-talented. But obviously we're talking about a really serious topic here, so I want to get right to it here. I want to talk about the opioid crisis, and let's specifically talk about what's happening in Cleveland starting on Monday with the National Prescription Opioid Litigation that opens up on Monday in federal court in Cleveland. Now, you didn't want that to happen. You led a group of attorneys general and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to try to delay that trial. Why is that? There's two really important reasons here. One is a little bit theoretical and legal. The other is extraordinarily practical. Uh, the legal theory is that the Attorney General speaks for the state of Ohio. These uh, cases sound in a legal doctrine called parents patriae, uh, which basically means that the sovereign is moving to protect its people. Um, well, we don't have the United States, or excuse me, the United Counties and the United Cities of America. We have the United States. And our federal system of dual sovereignty um, with enumerated powers to the federal government and the remainder rem belonging to the states or to the people, uh, it's simply, in my view, and I believe that when we get a hearing on the merits someday on the law, we'll prevail. Um, counties and cities simply don't have the authority to uh, bring these claims. But the practical matter is maybe as weighty or even more weighty in terms of our society and the economy at large. Basically what's happening with the multi-district litigation is each of these local entities are taking a sliver of a claim that belongs to Ohio because this is a statewide epidemic, a statewide injury. And they're carving that sliver off and going, uh, not in any particular order, to court to seek redress. There's several things that fall from that. Number one is we've got overlap of claims and people. Cuyahoga County and Cleveland have an overlapping area, right, where, where it's the same people in both entities. And yet they're both in court claiming damages. There are Obviously, those are also pieces of Ohio, uh, and, and so we have a situation where three separate entities are claiming some of the same people uh, to represent them. It's a little bit like that old, uh, some of you may remember the commercial where New Coke was uh, interviewing lawyers to sue classic Coke. Uh, it was very funny, uh, but when you're having to pay the bills for both lawyers and the potential damages, it's maybe not quite as funny. Um, so the one other thing that comes from that, uh, and not to belabor it, but it's a very important question, is if you are in the business of making something that one day becomes the subject of a lawsuit, it's one thing to say that you ought to be held accountable, that there ought to be a legal remedy in court. It's another thing to say that we can have 2,600 lawsuits from different organizations and governments all claiming the same injury. So you, these defendants, uh, 
even if they have cognizable def defenses to the claims, are really put in a position with all these lawyers and all these lawsuits where they can't afford to be heard uh, in a court of law because of the costs and the risks. Uh, so we scale up the risks so high that this doesn't become justice, it becomes extortion with a lawsuit. You've also talked about how the rest of Ohio might be left out of whatever settlements might come out of this. And though the situation is that the judge has certified all cities and counties throughout the United States as part of this negotiation class, correct? And so every county, every city does have an opportunity to carve out something for themselves. Why do they need you to argue that for them? Well, uh, aside from the arguments that I've already raised, the problem with the negotiating class, uh, first of all, it's not permitted by the federal rules. Uh, it's a new creature uh, that uh, was that made, up out of whole, made up out of whole cloth. Uh, but in addition to that, you've got the problem that you're required as a member of the class to opt out before there's a settlement. You're buying a pig in a poke. You've got no idea how to, how to weigh your risks, the potential rewards, because you've got to make a decision to be in the class before you even know what the outcome of the class is. I, I think it's contrary to law, frankly. Let me ask you about the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's where you had filed your request for the delay. In rejecting that request, they noted that you filed this in August. And they said that already there had been extensive preparation done. There had already been some settlements that had been tentatively reached as well. And the judge in the case, Daniel Polster, wrote to the Sixth Circuit that your request was untimely in the extreme. And your filing actually upset some counties and cities and mayors and county commissioners who they said they felt like you were trying to pull a power grab here. Well, it's important to recognize that what we're talking about is two different things, whether you're at the council table or whether you're at the table for the solutions. I think that Ohio should not be vivisected in court into its component pieces. Jackson County, Ohio, has double, double the amount of morphine per person, a morphine equivalent dose uh, that, that was shipped in as Cuyahoga does. Cuyahoga is not a good bellwether. They were not the front of the, uh, not that they haven't been hurt, uh, but they were, that was not the epicenter of the opioid epidemic. Uh, so Cuyahoga gets to go. They've gotten tens of millions of dollars in settlements. Jackson County has zero. They didn't have a trial date to get heard. They're not, they're not getting anything. And so what's going to happen is at the end of this process, a whole bunch of money is going to come, been, has, is going to come out to buy off these early trials, and everybody else is going to be left with what remains. I wouldn't be surprised if this goes through several iterations and we fail a global settlement that the last portion of litigants, which will probably include places in Appalachia that have been the hardest hit, are left arguing over scraps and bankruptcy, while the counties and cities that were lucky enough to get the first trial dates are winning set settlements that largely make them whole. And that's just fundamentally not fair. My job is to speak up for the entire state, not just part of it. It was interesting that the words power grab were used here because you also used that phrase to describe the people who had gotten into the lawsuit in the first place with the whole argument of they were arguing the state's claims here. Uh, perhaps I can uh, chalk that up to rhetorical hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk about the, the settlements. And there are going to be settlements, whatever. There have been four already. Uh, the, obviously, whatever happens with this trial, there will be an outcome here. How should this settlement money be divided up? Well, that's a key thing that um, had some misapprehension or misunderstanding to begin with. <laughs> the state of Ohio doesn't have any local infrastructure, okay? The, we don't have a state police. Some places do, but we don't have that in Ohio. We don't have um, state treatment centers. Those live at the local level and they're funded by local atom boards and whatnot. Um, we don't have uh, state foster care. Now, there's regulation and policy making that goes on. There's certain 
certainly funding that goes from the state to the local level. So if we want to do what we ought to do and what I'm committed to do, which is to make sure that this opiate settlement money, if there is any, goes to fix the problem, clean up the mess, then it's going to have to go to the local level because that's where the boots on the ground are to actually do something here. Uh, I met just this morning uh, for a couple hours with uh, treatment professionals, local government officers, uh, <coughs> public health folks to actually discuss how should we prior prioritize these things and what should be the mechanism that we do to make sure that this doesn't go to fix the roof on City Hall or to plug the deficit in, in the state budget, but actually goes to try to mend the tremendous harm that's been done in our communities and our families. The two Bellwether counties here, Cuyahoga and Summit County, uh, Cuyahoga County has listed, has put out a, a plan on how they want to spend it. Uh, Summit County has a task force, I believe, that they're going to come up with how they want to spend the money. Have you looked at those? Are, are, are you, do you think that that's in line with what you're thinking on how that money should be used? Actually, what's in line with my thinking is that they're doing local planning. Look, we, we don't know very much about what works. We know some things that don't work uh, here, but we desperately need innovation. I, I will tell you there's nobody in Ohio today that can provably assert that they've got the solution, that they know what to do about this. We know some of the things that need to be done. So what I would like to see are broad guardrails to make sure that this isn't spent outside uh, of the opiate epidemic. But within those broad guardrails, I would like to see individual communities taking account of their individual resources, their institutions and traditions, the cultures of their community. And let's try lots of stuff. And if we have a 10-year settlement or a 20-year settlement, or as has been reported, an odd year, 18 years, I don't know how you come up with 18 years. Um, <laughs> But uh, if we have a long-term settlement, let's spend the first two or three years allowing lots of different experiments, see what works, and then we can coalesce around the things that are creating progress for us. But we don't need a one-size-fits-all statewide solution. Well, that brings me to there was a, a bill that you had talked about earlier this summer that would have had the state kind of taking control over some of these settlement money. 10, 90 percent of the money would go to the legislature to uh, assess, I believe the, the terminology was address matters of statewide concern. 10 percent would go to your office and, and the lawyers that were working with you. And no less than 20 percent would go to local communities. What's the status of that legislation? Is that so, still something that you're behind? Well, that was a draft uh, that got out into the wild before the, uh, it had been vetted. I'm sure you've never seen that in your career at the State House. No. Um, I think that some sort, and what I was focused on is making sure that the state spoke with one voice. I'm still concerned about that, as I've described, and for the reasons that I've talked about. Uh, but what was really missed by that is that current law requires all settlements, that, all settlements to go into a state fund that is controlled by, guess who? The legislature. Uh, now, the legislature gives the attorney general in conjunction with the OVM director some authority, some leeway of dealing with that. The local governments didn't get anything out of statewide litigation. Um, this proposal made sure that there was a pot of money that was addressed to their concerns. But long-winded answer, if you, I, I, I feel like I'm you know, Desi Arnaz. Yeah, I got some susplaining to do. Uh, the, the, to answer your question, uh, I'm for some kind of a mechanism that prevents this piranha effect of, you know, hundreds of lawyers all piling on to the same litigation uh, and consolidating the, uh, these matters of statewide concern under the, the attorney general. But the rest of the mechanisms that we use to accomplish that and to uh, attend to the distribution of any uh, settlements, I think I'm completely open to and you know, want to reach a consensus. 
did that bill get introduced? I mean, as it far as I, I didn't think it was. So, so it's not going anywhere. The idea is still, as far as you're concerned, is that local governments would get settlement money so that they can spend it as they see is appropriate. Within the remedy of the harms. Uh, once again, once we start in, in California, the local prosecuting attorneys get a percentage of their um, consumer protection actions that they take, and many of them go around filing, filing lawsuits just to fund their office. Uh, I, I, I think that that's a bad uh, public policy, and I don't want uh, local governments to see litigation as a means of filling their, their budget hole. Uh, I don't want to see the state government do that. So requiring that, like the opiate epidemic, would be, you know, any settlement would go toward ameliorating that, to abating it, I think that if we've got a problem with toxic waste, the damages should go to cleaning up the toxic waste. If we have uh, a nuisance, then the, the uh, a, you know bad junkyard, the, the money that's won ought to go toward making sure that, that bad junkyard is fixed. You talk about the piranha effect here, and I think a lot of these settlements, because they've been big money settlements, that's where that's coming from. But communities will say they've spent billions of dollars, countless amount of money on law enforcement, foster care, hospitalization, all these issues, plus you've got people in those communities who are going to be suffering for generations. Is there, is the piranha effect sounds like it's, it's just trying to grab something, but these communities are suffering. So let's, let's talk about the piranha effect here for a second. Ohio has a law, uh, was passed two years ago, I think, TPAC, uh, that limits and, and stages the contingency fees that a lawyer can get, and it caps them at 25 million bucks. Now, having practiced uh, fee-for-service law, I could tell you that a $25 million fee is pretty good. <laughs> most of these small, uh, all, most of these local government uh, uh, contingency fee contracts are at 33% with no cap. So. Forget about the duplication and the fact that we are claiming to represent the same people. The fees for the state representing all of Ohio, all of Ohio, capped at $25 million. If we have a billion dollar settlement out there, do the math. $300 million for the attorneys? If it's $20 million, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars in, law, in, in legal fees nationally, but just for Ohio, a billion dollar settlement, the, local, the lawyers for the locals are gonna, are gonna take off $300 million. You wanna talk about the effects? You wanna talk about local communities? I want that $300 million reduced to 25. Let's put the rest of that $300 million back on the streets in our communities and not paying for Joe Rice's private airplane. Is that something that the legislature can do? Well, we have a little thing about post facto laws and impairment of contract. And as a rule of law guy, I don't know that there is something the legislature can do about this particular issue. Uh, but does, going forward, certainly. Does some of this come from memories that people have of the tobacco settlement and how that money was yeah. spent? And it, it seemed like this huge pile of money, but when it came down to actually using it to try to deal with smoking-related illnesses and things like this, it's not unlimited. Right. Um, and and the, in particular, I think a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth because uh, for those of you who weren't around, I see lots of young people here, um, 20 years ago, we you know, had this huge settlement, all this money, it was going to come in every year, um, you know, like bread upon the water. And then we had a uh, budget uh, deficit. I don't remember the precise year, I'm thinking it was 2005 or six, somewhere in there. And they said, 
hey, we don't have to make hard decisions about balancing our budget because we got all this tobacco money coming in, which was going to the Buckeye Tobacco Foundation. Let's just take that, and they sold the revenue stream going out for 25 years to a bunch of bondholders and took that money and they fixed their budget problem. And you know what we got for that? We managed to avoid making decisions for a couple of years. Boy, that was a good investment. Think about what we would be able to do today if we had had that money for the last 15 years continuing to come in to help us uh, deal with the, the problems that we've experienced. So, yeah, I think there's a bad taste in people's mouth. Um, but in fairness, that was the first time they had done one of these. Uh, that, was, that was the first thing of its kind. I thought Betty Montgomery did a fabulous job leading nationally. And, uh, you know, yeah, there were, it turns out that there were things that we could have done better. Well, let's learn from them, but let's not, you know, end up is it crouching down in fear and failing to make good decisions for the future because we're afraid of what happened again. It's kind of the Vietnam effect, right? For a while, we didn't want to project any military force because we were so traumatized by what happened to Vietnam. And it led to an expansion of uh, global projection power by so former Soviet Union, the Afghanistan war, yada, yada, yada. Uh, let, let's learn from the past, but not be driven by it. And before we move off the uh, opioid trial that's happening in Cleveland starting up on Monday, let me just ask you one final question. The uh, settlements that you've seen and the ones that are being talked about, are, are those in the ballpark financially, do you think, or, or do you feel like there could be more, that, that the damage has been so extreme that that amount of money isn't going to be enough? Well, let's be clear. If we liquidated the entire pharmaceutical industry, that's not going to be enough to deal with the out year, uh, as you've talked about, the year after year uh, damages and problems that we're going to face. Um, and I don't think it's useful to liquidate the phar pharmacy industry uh, and rely on Europe or, or wherever. Uh, now, that being said, $18 billion over uh, 18 years, which is what was uh, reported publicly. There's some other things out there. Uh, I, w w my staff thinks that that's too light, and we'd like to see uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more aggressive approach to it. Let's broaden this to the whole opioid crisis in general in Ohio. Um, in the last couple of years, the state has shut down pill mills, put limits on painkiller prescriptions, increased penalties for drug trafficking, put more money into treatment, into law enforcement, into foster care, into children's services. Has the state done enough to try to deal with the problem? I mean, the, the numbers of deadly overdoses have gone up over the years. Obviously, we were just talking about the generation, potentially, of kids who are suffering here, as well as communities. Has the state done enough? The state hasn't done enough. Uh, and here's the problem. I like to, to compare this to a big water main break. What happens when a big water main breaks? The whole neighborhood floods, right? And you've got flood waters everywhere. It's damaging property. Traffic comes to a standstill. We've been out there trying to clean up the flood waters. Uh, with buckets and, and mops while the water main is still gushing water. We've got more addicts coming into the system every year, new addictions, uh, and 80% of them are still coming from medical pathways. So the thing we need to do is figure out how to turn off that water main break so that we stop the new supply of water, then we can start to clean it up effectively. So let me give you one example of what I mean by this. We announced a couple of weeks ago uh, that my office, in conjunction with uh, BCI and uh, uh, University of Cincinnati uh, Hospitals uh, Emergency Room and the emergency practice here at Ohio State, are combining to look at a uh, pharmacogenomic study. It comes down to this. I had back surgery. Uh, six years ago, I think, and they gave me some hydrocodone afterward for the pain. I took it for a few days, stopped, no problem. Didn't want to take more, didn't get addicted. 
I also have a friend who is a Marine, and he had injuries from the service. They prescribed prescription, okay? This isn't, you know, going out and finding heroin. He's prescribed uh, the opiates, gets addicted, lost his family, lost his house, lost his job, ended up spending some time inside. This is a United States Marine. Do you think he has willpower problems? Do you think he's not tough enough? No. His brain and his biochemistry got scrambled by this stuff, and it ruined his life. But what's the difference between him and Dave Yost? I guarantee you I'm not a better guy. I don't have more willpower. I'm not stronger or tougher. What's the difference? It's probably genetic. So we're looking at uh, to do a 1,500-person study of people who present with opiate use disorder through you know, a Narcan incident in the emergency room to answer the question, what's different? If we can get to a point where a doctor, who's remember 80% of these are happening through a medical pathway, either directly or by diversion, if we can give the doctors a robust, objective tool that can say, Jim, we're going to have to manage your pain a different way because you're at high risk for opiate disorder, opiate addiction. Think of all the people that we could prevent from coming into the system. And when you ask, has the state done enough, here's the, here's the fundamental thing. We've got to figure out whether it's through behavioral economics, through medicine, through rules of practice, standards of care, or research, we've got to figure out how to have fewer people getting sick with these addictions every year so that we can actually start to clean it up. This study you're talking about, it's a $1.6 million study, 1,500 patients who would opt into this through those facilities, uh, and then they would you'd look at to try to find out what their genetic markers are to try to prevent. Uh, let me ask you, uh, what kind of concerns do you have about people's privacy who are involved in this study? So first of all, the DNA will be anonymized. We won't be able to use it. Uh, we won't have the identifying information. We'll just have the <laughs> medical history, uh, the medical information. Secondly, we're only looking at 80 gene markers that are, so we don't have the entire genome. We can't do uh, you know, the, uh, what's that show on TV? <laughs> Uh, the, the CSI? CSI. We okay. can't do the CSI thing. The Attorney General couldn't is. think of CSI? <laughs> um, He's thinking of too many things. And, and here's the cool thing, Karen, because uh, I was a little concerned about that, too. Were we going to have a hard time persuading people? We've got people emailing and phoning in and saying, hey, I had a surgery. I had the, the, uh, the opiates, and I didn't get addicted. I want to give you my DNA. I want to, I love this idea. I want to participate. I want to help. Where do I sign up? So I, I think we're going to find that this isn't as hard as we might think. In the end, when you do hopefully find these genetic markers, is there ever a concern about that those people would be treated differently by insurance companies, that they would have a harder time acquiring insurance because they do have that potential risk of getting addicted to opioids? Or well, is that way down the road? Yeah, hopefully I'm successful in my uh, litigation to protect pre-existing conditions in the Fifth Circuit, uh, which where the, the Obamacare challenge is right now, and that, that won't be an issue. Fair enough. There's also in your office uh, the Scientific Committee on Opioid Prevention and Education, SCOPE. Tell me about what that does. So this goes back to the question, how do we turn off the water main break? Um, this is a group, an uh, interdisciplinary group of science scientists. We've got a uh, doctor of pharmacology. We've got a, a doctor of nursing practice. We've got a, stati a statistician. We've got a behavioral economist and a, a psychologist. And their job is to go through the existing scientific literature, all the studies that are done all, all the time. Let, let me tell you something, folks. Your, your elected officials do not spend time reading scientific journals. <laughs> I know that's a shock. Uh, so it raises the question, what do we know now? 
after the last 10 or 15 years of research, what's out there as pure abstract knowledge that has application in the public space? What can we learn here uh, from what, what's already known to the scientists but is not known to the policymakers? Um, and so SCOPE is doing this, uh, this uh, study that we talked about, but they're also looking at some other very I got a status report yesterday. Uh, they've got some very intriguing questions based on the existing scientific literature where I think we can really up our game. I'm so excited to have this group of, of eminent scholars uh, helping us to formulate our thinking on this. And this comes not too long after there was a contest that the state was running through the Third Frontier program to try to find some high-tech solutions to the opioid crisis. I, th I guess you and other state officials are thinking it can't just be law enforcement. It can't just be, as I've heard before, arresting your way out of this. There has to be another solution. True. But you know what? We also can't treat our way out of it. Let me tell you a hard fact. People, that, uh, if you take uh, 100 people that get through a 30-day residential treatment program, which is kind of, that's what we do, right? That's where you're going to go. If you, when you talk about treatment, by and large, you're talking about a 30-day residential treatment program. Three out of four of them will relapse within six months. Three out of four. That doesn't mean that our treatment professionals aren't good. What it means is that we don't know enough about this disease and about how to fix it. I was talking with a young uh, specialist, a, a doctor who does nothing but addiction disorders, and he said every opiate addiction is secondary to something else, an injury, a surgery. He said, so we can do a lot by understanding what underlies it. They looked at me and he said something I'll never forget. He said, the problem is sometimes what that addiction is secondary to is not so easy. So we still don't know how to fix a broken heart. I want to remind the audience that you can ask questions here in just a moment. Uh, please feel free to step up to the microphone and think of what you want to ask the Attorney General. But before I do that, I want to ask you one more question here. Um, Opioid prescriptions are made available through Medicaid. Uh, I think the stat I was reading from the U.S. Inspector General is like six in ten Medicaid recipients have had an opioid prescription prescribed to them. Is the state in any way liable or culpable here? I mean, the, the options for non-opioid treatment have not been great for Medicaid. The, there's now a waiver that would allow a little bit more flexibility, but what's the state's role here? Look, there's lots of different people who have roles in this. Uh, the DEA had extensive uh, data in their ARCOS uh, system and didn't do everything that I would hope that they would do. Uh, but the bottom line is the people who are most responsible are the people that lied, the people that lied to market their product and said, don't need to worry about addiction. This is a different day, a different product. Don't need to worry, Doc. They sponsored, spent money sponsoring medical education to tell doctors about how this wasn't addictive. Of course, that's not true. So when you want to talk about shared responsibility, there's shared responsibility. There are other, there are other things that uh, and other players and all kinds of causes that go into this, but the prime cause was the misconduct in marketing uh, and the failure to warn about the dangers of a very dangerous product that have devastated our country. And I'm a, folks, I'm a pro-law, a rule of law, pro-economic growth, business-friendly Republican. I, I do not go out suing uh, lightly. But when you start misrepresenting about your product, you've crossed a line, and uh, I think there needs to be accountability. Well, it is CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name and ask your question. Please avoid editorial comments, and remember, questions do end with a question mark, please. So let's get started. First question, please. 
Good morning. Thanks to, for inviting us all here to this important um, discussion. My name is Shar Stilley, and I am a director of programming for an early learning center on the south side of Columbus. We've been in business since 1927, and we've seen generations of families come through um, primarily at risk, but what our biggest challenge is is the children um, who've been affected by this opioid crisis. So my question to you is, um, we want to serve these children who are either in foster care, kinship care, born with um, addiction or experience trauma, whether it's watching the drug abuse or domestic violence. Um, are, in looking at this uh, settlement, is there any inf information that will be coming uh, or, or financial support that will be coming to programs to help children five years and younger? So children at risk. Is there anything in the settlements that you're seeing or anything that would really help people who are dealing with children at risk? Yeah, so understand that there are, there, there isn't even a, a detailed settlement yet, much less any decisions within the individual states or local communities about how that's going to be uh, allocated. Um, so I, I can't answer your question except to say that this, uh, it is far, wiser in my personal judgment, I'm only speaking as Dave Yost here, not uh, for the state of Ohio, um, it's far wiser to spend our resources trying to break what could be a generational cycle of trauma and addiction than it is to try to take uh, remedi remedi remedial measures later in life. So thank you for your work. Uh, there is, uh, NAS babies are a, a special burden, and but a special joy. I know it's emotionally draining and I, I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you for your question. My name is Beth Wooded and I wanna go back to the tobacco settlement. You use the word fear, I think the word is distrust. And what mechanism would you suggest you put into place to guarantee to those local communities that money would be spent as intended rather than what happened with the tobacco settlement money? Well, we certainly don't want to prescribe opiates to deal with the distrust. That was a joke. Uh, That's not, it's, it's not on the label. It's not, it would, that would be off label, so. Yeah. Look, uh, to, to deal with that very understandable distrust, uh, I think it's critically important to have open processes and ongoing dialogue, not a one-off or a two-off, uh, not just the meeting I had this morning. But I think it's important for those of us that are engaged in this litigation to have that involvement and engagement with local communities, with treatment providers, uh, with the families uh, that have experienced the uh, aftermath of opiate addiction. So, uh, and that still won't be enough. What we, have, what we have to hope for is we can get the level of distrust low enough that we can hear each other and come to an agreement. Collaboration needs to be the key. Hi there, my name is Blythe Barno. I work with Faith and Public Life. I'm a minister and also do work around drug policy and drug user health. And one of the questions that I have is that uh, a lot of the folks that I work with who are doing on the ground work, underground work that's not funded, that's not professionalized, they know what works. Narcan distribution works, fentanyl testing strips works, syringe access works, all of these things work but are often not funded uh, in preference for places like public health departments, law enforcement, and other spaces where people who use drugs are, are historically distrustful for good reason because of criminalization, discrimination. Uh, and I'm thinking about the study that you're taking on. There's a really incredible study that was done in the 70s by a man named Bruce Alexander that talks about the ways that connection is actually, connection and trauma um, are foundational to why people, some people become addicted and some people can use recreationally. Uh, and in the story that you shared, I would suppose that trauma is the difference. Your, your friend was a Marine, you were not, and that really plays in. But the question I have is one, how would you advocate uh, for grassroots on the ground funding uh, for this money that were to come out? And then additionally, one of the things that's doable right now is our Good Samaritan legislation in this state 
is woefully inadequate and excludes people on parole and probation, uh, which are the people who need that legislation the most. Uh, and when black and brown people are overrepresented in the prison system, they are then underrepresented in their ability to benefit from the Good Samaritan legislation. So how would you ensure that black and brown people, communities of color are benefited from the money and policy that's coming out of your office? So I think that the best thing that the state can do is to involve local communities because those local communities know their populations and their demographics. They're going to look out for you know, their populations which are, are different from city to city and county to county. Uh, that being said, the, uh, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you that there's a demographic difference uh, of impact uh, from Oh, I'm sorry, there's not a demographic uh, difference in impact, but there is a demographic impact in funding where communities of color are underfunded, not given the same access to resources. They're, it's not that communities of color use drugs more, we know that they're not, but they're underrepresented in our solutions. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, I don't know enough to be able to t say whether I agree or disagree with that. I'm questioning my, uh, I'm thinking through your question, the gap in the funding, uh, uh, the continuum, people have private, good private health insurance, largely at least their first go around to treatment, and it takes, on average, seven interventions to get to a place where you are, uh, have a uh, one year stable sobriety. But generally, that first, that first uh, go around is funded to some degree uh, w through the private insurance. Uh, there is Medicaid uh, and other resources available for the very poor. And it, the working poor uh, who are making a little bit too much but have too few resources uh, are, I'm thinking, I don't have proof on this, uh, I think that they're the ones that are falling into the, the unfunded gap. Uh, so thank you for raising the question. I will certainly think about it. Uh, but please remember, Attorney General is not the dictator or the governor of Ohio. And uh, ultimately, I'm not going to be the guy who's deciding uh, where dollars go. I'm helping to assemble the people to talk about it and to develop the rubric. Uh, and that's going to be the best I can do. All right, next question. Hi, my name is Casey, and I'm with a statewide drug war survivors union called Unharming Ohio. So all of the okay, um, all of the on the ground work that Blythe was just speaking about. That's what I do. Um, my question is fairly simple. It's if it is being argued in court that these opioid manufacturers and distributors are the culprit for creating and fueling the opioid epidemic here in Ohio, why are the victims who are devastated by the wreckage, namely low-level drug dealers and people who use drugs, still arrested and incarcerated in high volumes? Well, as far as the dealers go, uh, dealing illegal drugs is still a crime in Ohio, and is, if you're going to create a a crime, you need to enforce it. Uh, the General Assembly decides to decriminalize that. That's a policy decision with which I wouldn't agree, but that's within their authority. I enforce the laws that they write. With regards to uh, users, the same logic applies, but a more important imperative exists as well. Uh, what we see in the uh, research regarding probation uh, work is that the chances of someone obtaining uh, long-term sobriety uh, are actually much greater if they have court supervision combined with resources uh, and the threat of incarceration hanging over their head to help. Why is that? Because that first year while your brain is kind of resetting its biochemistry are your, is your highest risk of a relapse. Having the additional supervision and some teeth to back it up 
in the court system actually helps you get to that point where your brain has reset and you can maintain your sobriety. So uh, I certainly don't want to see uh, drug users put in prison uh, for lengthy periods of time. Uh, but I think having some threat of incarceration uh, for users uh, is ultimately a tool that needs to be in the toolkit for trying to help people gain sobriety after they're addicted. Yeah, and I wasn't, oh, sorry, I know I gotta get closer. Um, no, and I wasn't speaking on um, going through the justice system as a means of, you know, having like a one-year sobriety, like you said, having the threat of probation, it does get people clean. But people, like the reality is that people are incarcerated for doing drugs, and um, when you get out of jail, that's the highest risk of relapse, and it's the highest risk of overdose death, too. So that it needs to be named when we're talking about the opiate crisis. Yeah, and I've long said addiction shouldn't be a felony offense in Ohio. Next question, please. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Edwards, and I'm a financial advisor with Merrill Lynch. We have a law that says we cannot hold gun manufacturers liable for crimes committed with the weapons that they make. Um, I don't necessarily support that, but my question is why are we going straight to the manufacturers or spending most of our attention there rather than the pharmaceutical middlemen uh, and the doctors themselves who are abusing their prescription pads? Well, I would defer that. You're, you're speaking about a, a federal law on the immunity from, uh, for gun manufacturers. I suppose someone might say that, uh, you know, that that's implicated by the Second Amendment, uh, but I'm not a member of Congress that didn't vote for that law. I didn't write it, and uh, I don't know what the rational basis to distinguish the two would be. There is a state level, uh, it started in Ross County, I believe, another set of, of uh, allegations that the state is involved in here yes. beyond the Cleveland case, but that's not, that doesn't speak to what her question was, right? I, I think she, I, uh, do I understand it right? If, why, why, do we, why do we protect one set of manufacturers and not another? Yes, and why aren't we spending more time on the other players involved in the epidemic? <clears throat> The state's case, that, uh, the, the case that is in Ross County, that's uh, aimed at manufacturers, distributors, correct? Distributors. Manufacturers are in Ross County, the distributors are in Madison County. Okay. So that, that doesn't really answer your question, but that at least clears that okay. up. So. Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Hi, my, my name is David Axelrod. Uh, as a lawyer who sometimes gets involved in cases involving opioids, it seems to me that we've reached a point at which any doctor with a pain management practice is almost presumed to be overprescribing opioids, as a result of which many are afraid to, excuse me, afraid to prescribe the levels of drugs that they believe their patients truly need. Are you at all afraid that we're creating an environment in which patients can't get the levels of medication needed to deal with serious chronic pain for which nothing else has worked? Uh, thank you for the question, and I, I, we need to continue to have opioids. I, somebody is dying of uh, stage four cancer, I don't want them screaming until they die. Uh, we ought to allow uh, them to have the opioids that they need to control their pain. There's something very cool going on at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and I'm not a big fan of per se rules. You're only allowed to have three Oxycontins. Well, what if you're dying of stage four cancer? I'm okay with you having a month. Uh, where I, I wanna trust docs. What they're doing at the Cleveland Clinic is um, they've got an internal uh, committee that is using their, um, their electronic medical records to look at all of the uh, prescriptions that are being written by their docs. They're segregating them by practice specialty and then they're looking at the distribution curve. And so, you know, somebody that's two uh, standard deviations out from the mean isn't getting a government bureaucrat coming down on them. They're talking with a peer doc who says, hey, do you realize that you prescribe more uh, pain meds than any other orthopod in, in our system? Um, can we talk about that? Can we look at alternatives? Can you think about necessity? What do you do to assess uh, quantity with the quantum of pain? Uh, 
And it's really cool. What's been happening as they've been doing this is they're moving the mean backwards. Uh, they're reducing the number of, of pills prescribed, but they're not doing it by fiat. They're not setting an arbitrary number and saying, don't go over that line. They're looking at how the practice uh, how, how the practices are and, and doing it peer to peer. I think that's more effective. It's more sensitive to the patient care and is a lot more logical. We have time for one more question. Last but not least, uh, hi, my name is Leah Dooley and I'm with Nationwide Children's Hospital. I'm curious that when you have created this scientific panel, do you have a pediatrician there? The, the two, well, there's e, the ER docs. I don't think we have a pediatrician on. So there's great evidence that uh, addiction can start in youth and that social determinants of health seem to be a trigger for that. There are differences in treatment, so I would encourage you to reach out and have a pediatrician on staff. I'm actually sitting with three of them that are all working in addiction <laughs> medicine. they put you so up to this? I, yeah. Oh no, I, I am on here, I'm here on my own steam. Um, but I would also like to mention that, um, are you aware of a program called Amethyst? It's here Amethyst, in Columbus. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Amethyst seems to be the only program right now that has a really high rate of success. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to look at their programming and to fund it so that it can be replicated in other parts of the states. There are no other programs that are targeting women with young children. That's one of the biggest indicators of somebody not going into treatment because they don't know what's going to happen to their children. So that as a program, I would strongly encourage you to pitch to your scientific panel and please do have a peer, someone who's actually gone through addiction and made it through the other side, to sit on that panel so that they can vet what you are interpreting from the data. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Uh, Supreme Court cases and impeachment and all sorts of other things, but I'm really glad we had the opportunity to talk intensely and intensively about this topic. So thank you for being here. Enjoy the conversation, Karen. All right. Thank you. Oh, wait. Not yet. I hope you found today's forum enlightening. It's obviously a heavy topic, but I, I thought we addressed quite a, quite a range of, of issues that impact this important topic. So um, let's thank our speakers, Attorney General Dave Yost. And Karen Kassler. And special thanks to all of you. We look forward to seeing you next week at CMC.